Hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you here tonight, um, this afternoon. Uh, we are once again gathered for the annual Arthur Miller Lecture in Science and Ethics, which we hold every year, unless there's a pandemic. Um, and it honors the memory of Arthur Miller, an MIT alumnus who received his undergraduate degree here in 1934, his PhD in 1938. And he's noted for his work in electronic measurement and instrumentation. During World War II, he worked at the Radiation Laboratory. He later worked for many years to improve medical devices. Among his long-lasting contributions includes methods to reduce shock hazards in hospital monitoring systems. He also greatly improved commercial cardiographs, featuring new techniques to isolate patients from line and ground. The Miller Lecture has been hosted by MIT's Program in Science, Technology, and Society for many years, uh, thanks to the generosity of Arthur Miller's family. It is an annual event open to the entire community, focusing on themes at the intersection of science and ethics. I'm particularly happy that um, two members of Arthur Miller's family, Neil and Eliza, are able to join us again this year. Uh, we've been rendezvousing with the Millers um, once a year for so many years, it's just really wonderful to see you again. Thanks to the Miller family's great generosity, we've been able to host a number of remarkable uh, speakers over the years. We were just reminiscing um, that Paul Farmer, the late Paul Farmer, sadly, was, was um, one of our most memorable speakers. Um, but also uh, Jim Kim, who was um, his, his pal, <laughs> former president of Dartmouth College and, now, and, and then president of the World Bank. Just a list of um, people who you would love to hear any old time. Tonight, we're super fortunate um, to have Kendall Hoyt um, giving the Miller Lecture. Kendall is um, an assistant professor of medicine in the Giesel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College and senior lecturer in the Thayer School of Engineering, a nice and unusual combination that befits a, an MIT graduate. Her research is focused on health security, innovation policy, and vaccine development. She serves on the US COVID Commission Planning Group. She has served as a consultant for the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations and the Nuclear Threat Initiative. She's the author of Long Shot, Vaccines for National Defense, which came out uh, with Harvard University Press in 2012. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree at Duke University and her PhD here in our own program uh, in 2002. She was a fellow, at, right after that, she was a fellow in the International Security Program at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard's Kennedy School from 2002 to th 2004. She was then again a visiting scholar at the Harvard Global Health Institute and the Belfer Center again uh, from 2017 to 2019. Before obtaining her degree, she worked in the International Security and International Affairs Division of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, she also worked in the Washington Office of McKinsey and Company and the Center for the Management of Innovation and Technology at the National University of Singapore. So she's been very busy, um, both before and after getting her degree uh, here at MIT. Today she's going to talk about some recent work she's been doing on the pandemic itself and on COVID preparedness and testing and all of that. So please help join me in welcoming Kendall back to campus. <laughs> It is very exciting to be here. Thank you so much. Um, just to Deborah and to the STS program, which afforded me so many opportunities. I can't even tell you. I mean, and to David Mandel, who can't be here, my advisor, I mean, the freedom, you know, to look at every aspect of the problem, any whatever problem I chose, but in this case, vaccine innovation, the historical aspects the social, the cultural, the economic, the organizational, the, I mean, it was just, it was an opportunity unlike no other. I mean, what program lets you do that? And I'm just so profoundly grateful for what it allowed me to do. Um, so the question that has really animated my research, 
both then and now, really broadly, is how do we get the medicine that we need when we need it? Um, and you know, as infectious diseases continue to emerge and evolve, you know, we have an urgent need to understand the conditions that drive rapid vaccine development, to accelerate vaccine development campaigns. And this is an argument I used to make a lot, and it's getting easier to make all the time. <laughs> People aren't like, what, why anymore? Um, but truly, the sooner safe and effective vaccines can be developed and deployed, the greater their social value, right? Especially if you can squelch um, the rapid emergence of a new virus or you know, any other disease. So really, what can we learn from historical development campaigns? Um, including this most recent vaccine race of 2020 to figure out how we can run faster. Um, so here's the issue. What makes it tricky? Almost all drugs in the US are developed by the private sector, right? So most pharmaceutical companies are not gonna want to pivot from their current development projects to chase after a disease with an uncertain future. Right? It could be like SARS, it could be like Zika, it could be like Ebola. Um, and there's huge opportunity cost in doing that. It could disappear as quickly as it came. Those companies that do choose to respond are unlikely to expand capacity to socially desirable levels. Right? So even with global demand for COVID vaccines, there remains an enormous gap between the social and the commercial incentives to maximize capacity to respond appropriately for timely intervention as well. So the estimated social value of a timely and globally accept, uh, accessible COVID vaccine is $5,800 per course, not the currently negotiated price of 40 to $60 per course. So this misalignment of commercial and social incentives for vaccine development, it exists for emerging infectious diseases like Ebola, for novel respiratory diseases like flu or coronaviruses, um, or for any pathogen that one might want to use in a deliberate attack, like a biological weapon. And this is the sort of impossible problem for which governments must prepare. So it's hard from a scientific point of view, from a logistical point of view, from an economic point of view. Um, and I've studied this problem from many angles over the years. I mean, first here at MIT in this program, I looked at um, you know, vaccine development for national defense and what happens when um, the social need is very high but the financial incentives are very low. Um, I later did a stint at CEPI, the um, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, where early on, before they really existed, I helped them develop the business plan for how do you get you know, a pipeline accelerator going for epidemic vaccines. Um, and I also uh, led the team that developed their rapid response strategy. We can talk some more about that later. Um, but what do you do when you have you know, a new epidemic or pandemic? How do you get things going very quickly? And I'm currently investigating the US response to COVID for the COVID Commission, the US COVID Commission, which is currently a planning group. Um, but there is a, a bipartisan bill in Congress right now to have a congressional commission. Um, so that's ongoing. So for the COVID commission, I have been tasked with examining our vaccine response, which is a daunting task. <laughs> so future generations are gonna look at the COVID race, the COVID vaccine race of 2020 at Operation Warp Speed is what we called it, which was the US program um, to develop medical countermeasures. They're gonna look at that as a stunning success. And it was. Um, the FDA authorized two vaccines for use in 11 months, which is one-tenth the average development time for a new vaccine. Moreover, six out of the six vaccines in the ultimate portfolio, it had originally been larger, have proven effective. 
Um, the two initial ones were, you know, were as high as 95% effective with the initial strain um, in these early trials. And I mean, this is a remarkable record. Given that the, an average of 90% of new vaccines fail in development, so, to what can we owe this stunning success? It's scientists and developers, executives, regulators, clinicians, and administrators, they worked tirelessly to get this vaccine across the finish line. Um, and it was a galvanizing moment in history where really everyone stepped outside of what was merely expected to do what was required. But the story, it does not lend itself to simple explanation. Learning the right lessons from history can be really fraught, especially when each faction, academia, industry, military, government, they can all claim credit for the outcome. So Moderna, which was heavily supported by federal research and then by Operation Warp Speed, crossed the finish line just one week behind Pfizer, which had refused all government assistance up to that point. So, but in its efforts to meet orders, to meet the actual demand for the vaccine, even Pfizer, which is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, could not sufficiently scale up without government assistance. So this is not a story in which government or industry single-handedly saved the day. And we can step back and we can consider some more uncomfortable questions. To what extent was the outcome a tremendous stroke of good luck? Two out of the three vaccine platforms selected for warp speed, the mRNA and the non-replicating viral vectors, had never been licensed by the FDA before. 10,000 things had to go right for those vaccines to cross the finish line. And 10,000 things did go right. And some people who are very close to that effort are still picking their jaws up off the floor. Um, so how were these candidates chosen? Right? In retrospect, were they the right candidates? Each vaccine targeted the spike protein. Should we have chosen a few candidates that targeted two epitopes, perhaps, to make it harder for emerging variants to escape vaccines early on? Were enough candidates chosen? Some studies indicate that the optimal pandemic portfolio actually contains 27 candidates when you estimate the probability of success of any one candidate and you want to have a high enough probability of success at the end of your campaign. So would this Operation Warp Speed model work again as well in an, the next pandemic? Um, what if the US had to get in line behind other countries and strike a deal with Russia or China for a vaccine? In retrospect, what would planners have wished they had done differently? For example, should the US have contributed more generously to a multilateral procurement mechanism like COVAX, just as an insurance policy, just as a backup? And then let's consider this. What if the US had committed to a deep portfolio of pandemic investments years ago? Pandemic preparedness plans have long since called for medical countermeasures that can be developed on demand, say, like in three to six months, in response to unexpected threats. So mRNA vaccines were recognized as a valuable platform that could enable this capability a long time ago. Um, but even with government support, mRNA vaccines languished because companies didn't want to develop a bleeding edge technology with a very uncertain regulatory path. Could mRNA vaccines have been deployed against the Ebola outbreak or against the Zika outbreak? Or imagine we had gotten the sequence early enough and we could have made a vaccine for China back in 2020 or even 2019 after the first reported cases, effectively squelching the outbreak before it spiraled out of control. It's essential to step back and ask these kinds of questions and examine the evidence and consider all the counterfactuals so we learn the right lessons from this outbreak. And this, of course, begs a question that's going to be very, very familiar to all STS students. How do we learn the right lessons from history? Right? I can hear it. I can hear you all thinking that. 
Um, and very few stories lend themselves to simple explanation. Can we untangle all the factors to identify a useful tale of causality? And can this tale inform future action? In some respects, as some have famously said, you know, history is just one damn thing after another. Right? You've all heard that. And yet, and this is Oliver Wendell Holmes, every day we have to wager our salvation upon some prophecy based upon imperfect knowledge. And so that's sort of the state of the art. <laughs> so it's with no small amount of humility that I embark on this task. And for better or worse, I have this repertoire of historical analogs that shape my perception of events. And this is what I worked on when I was here. So few realize that World War II was actually a watershed moment for vaccine development. War planners, due to their experience with pandemic flu, the 1918 flu at the end of World War I, recognized infectious disease as a national security threat. And they invested accordingly. So Tommy Francis, who is chairman of the Influenza Vaccine Commission, he said the pandemic demonstrated that viral influenza may be more devastating to human life than war itself. And so people were concerned that another world war would generate the epidemiologic conditions for another pandemic. And they mobilized industry and academia and government and the military to develop these vaccine development commissions to rapidly develop vaccines, and they did. They developed 10 new or improved vaccines against of diseases of military significance. Um, and in some cases, they produced vaccines in time to meet the objectives of specific military missions. So botulinum toxoid was mass produced before D-Day in response to intelligence, turned out to be very faulty intelligence, that uh, the Germans were gonna load V1 bombs with the toxin. And so we were gonna protect soldiers against that. Um, a Japanese encephalitis vaccine was developed in, in anticipation of an allied land invasion of Japan. And to give you a sense of timelines, the Influenza Commission licensed their first effective flu vaccine in 19 months from start to finish. And a young Albert Sabin of polio vaccine fame helped the military develop the very first Japanese encephalitis vaccine in 15 months. This is, you know, in the 40s. Um, so why were these programs so productive? Again, it's really easy to fall into a victory narrative. So for every vaccine development success, there are several failures. And one key factor that often distinguished success from failure was, not surprisingly, the maturity of the underlying science. Right? So when the basic science was well established, it was possible to you know, exert the kind of discipline and organizational structure required to do late stage development in manufacturing. And when it wasn't, it, it was not possible. You, you know, that was not subject to a timeline. That was not subject to organizational structures. So wartime programs, much like Operation Warp Speed, rarely generated new knowledge, but they excelled at consolidating and applying pre-existing knowledge for the purpose of product development. And they provided the structure that productively channeled unprecedented levels of federal support, a spirit of cooperation between different factions that didn't normally work together. Uh, as well, so military, industry, and academia. And these commissions departed from, you know, it was this team-based work. It was a, not the traditional investigator-initiated research model. Research was managed from the top down. It was integrated across disciplines and developmental phases. And it was situated in a community that facilitated information exchange. So I collectively refer to these three characteristics as integrated research practices. And they're a hallmark of many successful vaccine development programs. So over the course of the 20th century, there were uh, vaccines for 28, there were 28 vaccine preventable diseases. Um, Walter Reed used these techniques and they made contributions to 18 out of those 28. Uh, Maurice Hilleman, who came from Walter Reed, then went to Merck. They made significant contributions to 10 out of those 28. Um, 
And to some degree, this is how Operation Warp Speed was organized. Project directors would follow development from the field to the lab to the clinic to manufacturing. And this method afforded directors with the kind of situational awareness that they needed to make really rapid go, no-go decisions. Um, you didn't continue to fail to fund something that was failing. Um, you could see what was working, what wasn't working. And you could anticipate sort of the downstream requirements of what you were working on. Handoffs were seamless. Um, there was you know, fewer, fewer mistakes in the handoff. Um, further, these programs were often situated in a community that facilitates knowledge creation and information transfer. Um, there was a shared sense of urgency, social responsibility, and patriotism, and it really fueled collective problem solving, and there was a general willingness to disrupt orthodoxy. We're not going to do, this is not business as usual. So there's a cu cultural component to this too. Um, the U.S. became a front runner in the global race for a safe and effective COVID vaccine in no small part due to one of these legacies of World War II, which was robust public support for basic science. Um, one vaccine developer prior to, just right before the Second World War, had observed that the US at that point was merely a nation of assemblers. Quote, we've built our reputation most largely on adopting European ideas buying their stock, stamping it together, and putting a nickel plate or polish on it and calling it a product of America. But then the war cut supply lines uh, to European products, research, laboratory equipment, and it forced the US to develop some of these capabilities domestically. And meanwhile, and you're all familiar with Vinnie Verbush, you know, good MIT uh, professor and former dean, he, he mobilized scientists during the war under OSRD, the Office of Scientific Research Development, uh, which churned out technologies that changed the course of the war, ranging from radar to the atom bomb. And he set the stage after the war for this golden era of federal support for basic science, which he outlined in Science, the Endless Frontier. So the landscape for research and development changed in ways that carried momentum uh, for vaccine development as well, all through the 20th century. So by early 2020, when it became clear that the US needed to defend itself against a different, yet no less formidable foe than the Axis powers, the US found itself in the opposite position than we had in the beginning of World War II. So decades of generous federal funding for basic research had placed the US at the leading edge for innovation in many fields. So the two leaders in the vaccine race, Moderna and Pfizer, reaped the reward of years of scientific study of coronaviruses, of protein stabilization techniques, of mRNA vaccine uh, delivery platforms. DARPA, the NIH, CEPI even, had invested in these platforms precisely because we knew they were a nimble vehicle for rapid development. And absent these scientific advances, Operation Warp Speed would never have been able to say something as dramatic as we will have 300 million doses by January 2021. Um, crucially, however, the US was no longer a nation of assemblers. In recent decades, the American economy transitioned from manufacturing dominant to services driven, particularly in healthcare and retail. So, Reduced access to domestic manufacturing presents a critical vulnerability in a pandemic, which doesn't merely require new vaccines and diagnostics and therapeutics, but it requires enough for every man, woman, and child. Um, access and control to input supplies as well to make these things was also subject to disruption and holdup, and potentially intentional holdup by any number of countries by virtue of the way the supply chains and research and development have been globalized over the last couple of years, decades. Um, so as multiple companies scrambled to build capacity and obtain materials to meet anticipated demand, even large multinational companies like Pfizer required government assistance and they appealed to the US government we employed the Defense Production Act, 1950s mechanism. 
uh, to get in the front of the line for limited supplies. And it helped. Um, and it also demonstrates there are really hard limits to an entirely free market approach. And it, um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, just really what is the right level of government control? You know, how well did the DPA work? When did it work? When did it not work? What were the intended consequences and the unintended consequences? How can we better govern supply chains in a pandemic to avoid bottlenecks and to optimize capacity the next time? So looking ahead, really the race for COVID vaccines broke all previously standing land speed records, but vaccine development programs can and should move faster. More can be done to build portfolios, to optimize research development and manufacturing processes, to increase speed and flexibility. So Richard Hatchett, who is the CEO of CEPI, um, has set the future goal of 100 days. 100 days, because he calls it from lab to jab. From the moment you identify the new pathogen to the time that you turn vaccines into vaccinations and all that is required in between. But building this capability represents a system level challenge, crosses international borders, and it requires new technical and legal and administrative mechanisms to really streamline everything from global health surveillance and reporting and rapid diagnostic capabilities. It requires novel discovery, um, development and manufacturing platforms, distribution, clinical evaluation, regulatory approval, community engagement, and public health messaging across cultures. This is not a small ask. Um, to succeed, we're gonna to have to coordinate with emerging global governance structure for outbreak response and develop working relationships with multiple foreign governments and NGOs. Need to adapt to and incorporate opportunities in emerging fields like synthetic genomics, metabolic engineering, AI, machine learning. Um, it, it's, it's a heavy lift. And the US has coordinated successful mission-driven investments in the past, nuclear technology, space exploration, even vaccine development in the mid 20th century. But it has failed to coordinate a cohesive biosecurity R&D strategy for the 21st century. We've had a lot of good pandemic plans, actually. The Bush plan in 2006 was good. The Obama plan in 2010 was good. The Biden plan most recently is very good. Each new plan echoes the last, and there's high level consensus on what we need to do. And yet we fail to adequately execute these plans year after year. And it's hard in part because a coordinated response represents a system level challenge that draws from key capabilities within government. The CDC, NIH, FDA, BARDA, DARPA, they all own part of the problem, but no one agency is accountable for solving it at a higher level. Operation Warp Speed provided a temporary fix. Monsef Slawi, who directed it, uh, was given both the power and the cover to take risks and to make mistakes. He didn't need to make five trips to the White House to get permission for every one of his decisions. This is actually a principle that Vannevar Bush often mentioned. He called it, give a man his head. So, you know, if you have a mission, give them a really clear mission, but then you back off and you let him do it his way or her. But it was often him at that time. Um, so he had the authority to act and or coordinate across agencies. He was able to harness the full power of the US government. He used advanced purchase orders to guarantee demand uh, using what's called OTA, other transactional authorities, to rapidly execute contracts. It was a sort of a way to get around federal acquisition regulations, which are like this, if you've ever seen them. Um, and so you could get in front of you could get in front of the line with a pharmaceutical company for limited supply before other nations were able to. Not that that's the way we want to do it in the future, but it was certainly you know, part of the objective at the time. Uh, pursuing multiple candidates in parallel, streamlining clinical trials, 
validating and equipping sites, um, getting companies to agree to the same endpoint, which was quite radical. So you could compare apples to apples along the way. Companies don't typically want to do it that way for obvious reasons. Um, building manufacturing capacity at risk, mapping supply chains and leveraging the Defense Production Act to resolve bottlenecks for front runners it was an extraordinary effort. But Slowey left February 2021 and the operation now called the Countermeasure Acceleration Group or CAG has devolved to a more standard interagency process and it has struggled to coordinate a strategy for follow on innovation to address emerging variants. Uh, it remains slow to react to ongoing diagnostic and therapeutic needs. So the coordination problem has returned. So it's also hard because as a general rule, our federal capacity for intelligent oversight and investment has not kept pace with the growing number of federal contracts or all the contracts that the government has to manage. So just to give you a sense, federal contract spending has ballooned. It was about 200 billion in 2000, it's 665 billion in 2020. And yet the number of federal employees has held fairly constant during this period, about you know, 2.7 to 2.9 million. But strong oversight is required to manage costs, and schedule and performance. And it's essential if you really want to be able to align private incentives with public purpose, which is what this is all about. So this is the result of a decades long drive um, to outsource government functions. This has been going on for a while and it really began with an executive order from the Eisenhower administration to obtain goods and services from the private sector whenever possible. Subsequently, faith in free markets, free trade, distrust of big government have fueled this trend. And over the years, the government became hollowed out and the notion that you can't trust the government to do anything became a self-fulfilling prophecy. It became harder and harder to manage. But Operation Warp Speed is a good reminder of what the government can do under the right circumstances. So how can we cultivate this coordination function that Warp Speed once provided during these interpandemic periods or peacetime, if you want to call it that? What sort of emergency provisions do we need to have in place to be able to pivot and scale uh, vaccine development to say a wartime footing? Uh, what's the industrial policy that will build capabilities and partnerships required to be able to respond to future health emergencies? Building this capacity is gonna require long-term strategic planning starting now. Um, government will need to work with industry and academia to build a dynamic portfolio of pandemic ready products, research tools, countermeasures, manufacturing platforms. It will need to design operational structures that will allow it to coordinate across agencies in emergencies. So to do this, the US needs to make a commitment to build and exercise a pandemic capability on a continuous basis. So pandemics are, and we can talk about this too, in many respects, a national security issue that require the type of investment that affords a wartime readiness posture. It means not merely stockpiling a handful of medical countermeasures, but developing and exercising this on-demand capability um, so think about it this way, like the, mili the US military doesn't just build fighter jets to store them in a hangar, right? It trains pilots to fly them with regularity and at great expense. So a comprehensive plan might look something like this. Number one, you're gonna invest in a portfolio of pandemic ready countermeasures, capabilities research tools. CEPI is a great model for this actually. They have what they call their just-in-case strategy and their just-in-time strategy. So just-in-case is they pick, you know, these are the top three, they are the top five pathogens of pandemic potential that we're worried about. Um, they have the capacity to expand, but they also, there's technically feasible to make these vaccines. So we're gonna make them up to phase 2B. 
which actually doesn't cost that much. So if and when there's a NISA or or a LASA, NEPA, or MERS outbreak, then you've got something that you can rapidly evaluate in an outbreak. This really was the lesson of Ebola, right? We could have saved a lot of valuable time if we developed something that was ready to be tested at that time. And then they have their just-in-time strategy, which is investing in prototypes and platforms, like mRNA technology. Um, and then they also invest in sort of uh, tools and biomark tools that will help, like biomarkers or data analytics, uh, emergency protocols and trial design. You know all the things that you would be wish you ha would have in an outbreak if you needed to rapidly roll out an evaluation study. Okay, number two, use a variety of incentives and agreements to match asset to capital, i.e. What incentive structure, like milestone grants, prizes, advanced purchase commitments, work best with what partner and what technology or what stage of development? We need a sophisticated investment strategy so we can attract and retain the best partners for, for public purpose. Sorry about that. Um, related to this, we really need to bolster contracting capabilities within HHS. So we need to identify and adopt best practices in contracting for public purpose. We need talented negotiators at the other side of the table because quite often the government is outmatched when they're sitting across the table from Pfizer or Merck or who have you. Um, and they need to be able to negotiate with speed and flexibility and learn how to incorporate things like pivot and scale um, clauses, access clauses, all the things that you might want to have if the federal government is going to fund the development of a public use vaccine. Um, number four, we want to build prototype vaccine programs for, and this has been discussed in the news a lot, this is something the NIH is definitely moving towards, but for 25 viral families um, of concern. So what you do is you don't necessarily know what the next pandemic pathogen will be, but we do know that it will most likely be from one of these 25 viral families. And so you can start to characterize them. And it's kind of what we did um, in the run-up for um, SARS-CoV-2. We had researched MERS, we, and we researched SARS, so we understood a lot about coronaviruses. We knew that the spike protein was a good target we knew that the spike protein needed to be stabilized in order to be recognized by the immune system. But we don't know that much about a lot of these other viruses with pandemic potential. So what can we do now to put ourselves in the same position next time, to create our own luck the next time? Um, number five, build administrative preparedness. Um, this is something that Nikki Lurie, former director of ASPR and HHS, um, talks about a lot. So pre-agreed pandemic protocols for data um, collection, sample sharing, IP sharing, trial design. Can we pre-enroll cohorts for clinical trials? Um, can we designate testing sites? Can we have worm-based manufacturing for a number of different platforms? What can we do? Um, to be ready. Six, exercise teams to conduct rapid discovery and development. Upstream research programs like this viral prototyping program should feed into downstream development and manufacturing programs to design platforms for vaccine prototypes and to continuously test and improve manufacturing processes. These programs will require dedicated facilities to hone these skills, which are unique skills they're a key asset, and it's a capability that is not currently supported by the commercial market for drug development. And number seven, last and above all, you need an integrated command structure. This really is the lesson of World War II vaccine development commissions and Operation Warp Speed. It works best when these functions are integrated under a top-down command structure. So, to conclude, for all of its success, I would say that Operation Warp Speed was reactive 
It was time limited and it was COVID specific. And as such, in many ways, it's characteristic of our traditional ad hoc approach to health emergencies, which has bred a counterproductive cycle of panic and neglect, which is the title of an important World Bank report, after action report from Ebola. And already there's evidence that this pandemic is falling off the list of national priorities. A last minute revision of the 1.5 trillion omnibus funding bill stripped 15 billion from the COVID response package. That was the COVID response package. And we can't afford to skimp on measures to respond to this pandemic or to mitigate the next. I mean, quite literally. So official records indicate 6 million deaths worldwide. New studies think it's closer to 18 million. And the IMF estimates over 12.5 trillion loss to the global economy by 2024. And other estimates are higher, Larry Summers you know, I think, what did he say? He thought it was 16 trillion. And he, that was based on an estimate that the pandemic would end by 2021. So for this reason alone, really any measures we invest in now to mitigate current and future pandemics have enormous social value. So we need to implement strategic planning, governance, funding, and accountability that's commensurate with the scope of the problem. So we'll be ready next time. So, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, because we're recording um, this event, um, if you have a question or a comment, please come down to the microphone. They're on either side on in both aisles, um, and we will take. And Kendra will field your questions. Oh. Thanks so much. Um, it's fascinating, and it's uh, great to have you back here, and thank you for sharing your, your insights. Um, of course, I think all of us in the room, certainly myself, are terrific fans of the way you, uh, would be fans of the way you framed it with what can we learn from history, and how do we learn, how do we know we're learning the right lessons from history? I think you put mm -hmm. it so, so well, so thank you for that framing. And I wonder if you could say a bit more about two, what might be two, um, two uh, non-comparable examples between uh, looking back to, say, the Second World War in the United States and, and the present time. So you, you sketched, I think, very compellingly lots of continu continuities and similarities, but at least two, I'm sure a long list, but some at least come first to my mind that might break that similarity, and I wonder if you have thoughts on these as well. One was, I mean, uh, back in Von Bush's day, he and his colleagues here, for example, at the Rad Lab, didn't have to contend with large-scale, organized, often politically motivated skepticism that there exist things like electromagnetic waves, right, for the radar project, or that radar could actually successfully detect, say, a moving metallic aircraft, right? So whereas the extraordinary skepticism often, I think we'll all agree, sort of hyped up skepticism, organized skepticism, about whether either the severity of COVID or the safety of vaccines and all these things, how do we deal with, with sort of organized, not just skepticism, but sort of active misinformation, politically organized misinformation, which seems not to have so clear an analogy to the, um, not so amenable to the top-down org structure, Von Ever Bush stru strategy that did, that was very effective for things like uh, wartime rad lab. So number one is how do, that seems like a disanalogy. And I don't know if there's lessons from history or maybe other moments mm -hmm. to think about, hey, about that particular one. Mm -hmm. A second one also, which I think was, was not nearly so top of mind for folks like Bush uh, mm -hmm. and his era at the time that I think I wonder how we incorporate better and more uh, more completely these days would be possible limitations to a sort of nation-based uh, operational structure. So cross-border jet travel wasn't a thing for civilians in the 1940s, right, and, and slowly, so to speak, took off. Uh, whereas today, it's, it's very hard to imagine a kind of coordinated pandemic response that is focused narrowly on that, on, in a national security or nation, nation border sort of framing. Mm -hmm. And so, or maybe put another way, with given your experience, what might it take to further boost notions of, of things that are affecting other people in what seem like faraway places are also national security concerns here. Mm -hmm. If we look at, to this day, years in, even after the great successes you've described for vaccine development, rapid, safe, uh, effective vaccine development, the, the vaccination rates among people in many, many countries, for example, throughout Africa and other parts of the world, 
are lagging very uh, far behind other parts of the world. Uh, and that poses a problem for people there and for people who happen to be here, right? Yeah. Because of the, the, yeah. the degree of the, the relative ease of cross-national travel, which was not something that Vannevar Bush had to put into an org chart in the same way in 1940. So I'm just wondering, are these, are these counter lessons or are there other moments in history we can draw to, to try to be as, as effective on those challenges of the, of the present day in addition to the other lessons that I think you, you've shown so well are really effective analogies to, yeah. to earlier efforts? Yeah, so the first part of that is really a question about, you know, uh, disbelief and sort of skepticism about science and anti-vaccine sentiments and what have you. And I would say that really affects um, the administration of vaccines, but it didn't affect the development of vaccines, right? You know, Operation Warp Speed was pretty well insulated from all that. It was well funded. It had all the political cover in the Trump administration. You know, nobody questioned that we needed them and that they were good and that this should be a priority, right? So the development side was fairly well insulated. Administration was thwarted, um, and that's complicated. And but I would say it was probably a little bit worse, but not. It is worse than it was then, if you, know, if you were administering vaccines then. But anti-vaccine hesitancy, or anti-vaccine sentiment has been around ever since vaccines have been around. It's not a new thing. Um, so there will always be some subset of the population that will be skeptical and that will resist it. And it is interestingly and oddly connected to trust in government and or authoritative structures of any kind. Um, and so the solution is somewhere in the problem, actually. So tr if you look at Pew um, statistics over time, trust in government, the 40s and the 50s was up here. You know, we'd won a world war. You know, and it's gone down, 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 down. And so that is, um, that complicates any sort of public messaging about science and or vaccines. And so you need to, it, you, you can whittle it down a little bit, partly with education and public health messaging and targeting it to specific groups. You'll, it'll never get to zero. Like that can't be the goal, it will never get to zero. Um, you can whittle it down a little bit with access. Sometimes it is an access issue. And you can whittle it down a little bit with um, doing all the things we need to do anyway in terms of yes, teaching civics or uh, building trust in government partly by rebuilding these institutions so they do what they're supposed to do. So I mean, you trust government when it can accomplish its goals, right? And that is part of the project here. It's, a, it's an indirect yet very fundamental and practical way to boost trust in government. Um, so I mean, that's... You know, there's no silver bullet to that, but that, that's the way to get at the question. Um, you know, it's really interesting with the, the vaccine hesitancy piece. There's, um, I went to one of these CEPI meetings in Paris, and this was after Ebola, and they were having, they had the Ebola vaccine in Liberia, and they were having trouble getting, um, it, it was the same thing, it was access, it was, you know, misinformation, um, and it was insufficient education. And one of the ways that they handled this, this the whole meeting started off, you know, where it was a bunch of, you know, uh, old scientists, you know, with their, you know, a bunch of gray heads in there, and this beautiful Liberian woman in African dress came down to the podium at the start of this scientific meeting and broke out into song. Her name was uh, Queen N.D. She was a Liberian pop star. And what she had done was she wrote a song about Ebola and the virus and how it's transmitted and how you protect yourself from it and you know what's the vaccine and why do you want it and where do you go to get it? And the, the song went viral, you know, and it, it made a big difference. And so the message and the medium and the understanding which population you're trying to target and what the issues are. There's vaccine hesitancy has a million different 
forms. And people are hesitant for a million different reasons, and they need a million different messages in a million different languages. That's the problem. You know, it's not going to be a CDC pamphlet necessarily. That's not going to solve your problem. And so really targeting that campaign and understanding your audience is the objective. So. Hi, Kendall. Hi. Thanks for that really broad overview, which is really great. There's yeah. really lots and lots of things to talk about over dinner oh, or, good. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I had um, three questions, one of which sort of follows on David's. Mm. Um, and they're all kind of connected, but maybe not. But the story that you tell us um, is an American story. It is. Um, so I wonder if you could fantasize a little bit or if you could collate the knowledge that you have about development projects elsewhere in the world. After all, it wasn't Pfizer. It was a German startup mm -hmm. of Turkish scientists mm -hmm. that needed Pfizer in order to scale up to, uh, to production level, from lab Correct. level to production level. Mm -hmm. And then Pfizer needed another mm -hmm. boost, okay? Mm -hmm. So I don't know very much about the backstory of those scientists, mm -hmm. but I would assume that there are scientists like them in lots of places in the world. Um, which leads to another question, mm -hmm. which leads to the national security question, mm. the American national security question. Um, which is, as, as Dave, Dave just alluded to, is complicated not only because pandemics, by their very definition, are cross-border events mm. and, and travel in airplanes and, and mm -hmm. otherwise, but the entire um, biological research structure is now international as well right. and competitive. Right. And some of my friends in Washington are extremely concerned that there is um, a kind of arms race going on and that we are losing. And we are losing specifically to the Chinese, mm. who are investing heavily in all sorts of things, from basic stocks mm -hmm. of materials that are needed mm -hmm. to um, genomics and genetics, of course. Mm -hmm. um, biggest company in the world is BGI in, in China. Yep. Um, but even more so, they have been very strategic in buying up companies that we are outsourcing to. Yes. So you alluded to this very quickly, that there is the science piece of it, but there is all the manufacturing piece of it. And mm -hmm. we are losing out on the manufacturing mm -hmm. pipeline mm -hmm. because of outsourcing. Now, perhaps if we had better you know, contracting regulators and so on and so forth, one could start addressing that problem. Mm -hmm. But it, it feels like it's a massive problem that is geopolitical you know, on a, on a big scale mm -hmm. and not just something that can be solved in Washington, which Absolutely. raises the whole question about um, biosurveillance that we've tried to set up um, you know, the influenza was the first effort to do that. Mm -hmm. um, WHO doesn't really have any capacity to mm -hmm. do that. Um, then we tried after the SARS stuff, we tried to do it more effectively. There was talk about building, um, you know, BL3 and 4 labs mm -hmm. in Africa so that one could right. deal more carefully with emerging diseases there. Um, all of that is stalling in yeah. a way. And now with what's going on in Ukraine, you know, et cetera, it's gonna make it even harder yeah. going forward. So this so that that question, that second question, the national security question, is one of balance. How do you balance, yeah. you know, building boundaries and borders yeah. against the exchange that science depends upon yeah. and building cooperative you know, structures that, as you said quite correctly, I mean, I've, I'm a believer in this, that we need international cooperation in yeah. order to, to deal with these. 
And then I had um, sort of a third little question, just because you're in Washington, you know this stuff better than I do. Um, so um, Biden has come out with hopes for a DITRA-like biological initiative. And mm. I wonder what you think of that, because yeah. that would be, yeah. I mean, we all think about DARPA as the driver of so many of these technological developments. Could we do the same thing in biology, given the problems that I just laid out? And yeah. in, that, in that context, and maybe this is too micro, and we'll save it for dinner, but on the spike proteins, I mean, what do you know about the development of not just targeting the heads of the spike proteins, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but the stems, which would be, you know, which yeah. would be a strategy yeah. for us to develop? Okay. Anyhow, this I is a five-page, you know. three-part question. <laughs> Did you guys always give questions like this? <laughs> but I've got it. I think I've got it. Yeah, but I might need a little signposting along the way. Okay. We'll come back. I'll start from the top. Um, globalization is a double-edged sword, you, and you want both. I mean, you, you want to be able to take what's good, and you want to be able to protect yourself against your vulnerabilities, and it is really difficult. Um, you know, there's a, for a long time it was bandied about that like 90% of all of the active pharmaceutical ingredients were made in China. It's not actually true. I mean, I, I dug into that, and it what there is, though, is massive foreign dependency on like 94 different nations. There are single source, you know, that's the nature of globalization. That's how you get efficiency, right? You know, we depend, we have a total utter foreign dependency on about 94 different nations to create every drug that we need to have. Um, so what do you do about that? You're not gonna onshore everything, but you're gonna onshore something. What do you do beyond that? You want to create mutually assured dependence. We do this in cybersecurity too, right? There, it's, you know, you create sort of entanglements, right? Where yes, they, they were vulnerable, but there's a counter vulnerability if they do that. So you can have an agreement, a sort of a tit for tat detente, you know, when it comes to needing to access certain things. And then we can, you know, map the supply chain vulnerability and try to identify what really, truly must be onshored. Um, and it's, it's not going to be efficient, except that, except that as a national security cost. Um, there's a, um, something called CIVITA, the, which is, um, it, it's COVID specific, but the, the bones of it are really good. It's sort of an investment and trade agreement where you know, we map the supply chains and we subsidize those pieces that are absolute must-haves, like lipid nanoparticles. Um, and we create some, um, some, put some teeth into it. So if, if somebody's gonna create holdup and refuse to share, well then, um, then we, through Civita, which is a coordinated supply chain, you withhold an input that they need to. So you know, it doesn't mean it won't happen, but you have some leverage and then there is some central coordination for this. And I think that's a, not a bad model for a lot of really critical medicines that you might want to have. Um, you know, but you don't want to close it down and try to make it fully domestic, obviously, because you, know, there, you don't know where the next brilliant idea is going to come from. And you want to have these interdependencies. And there are efficiencies. And there is a reason it developed this way. Um, OK, so that's a slight answer to the first part. The second one was? Um, international development in science. So it was the German company. Right, right, right. And you know, we have these institutes mm -hmm. in India that probably have the mm -hmm. capability of doing this with a little bit of maybe more scientific exchange and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Just what does it look like mm -hmm. from other parts of the world mm -hmm. so that we're not constantly always just telling an American story? Right, right, right. And that well, fits into what you just talked yeah. about. Yeah, so well. I would love, so what I was trying to tell the story of was a campaign, mm -hmm. like a national campaign. So who else did that? The UK did it. Very few countries could build their own portfolio. 
and have their own in-country vaccine development campaign. Granted, it's globalized because the industry is globalized, but then there was Russia and there was China. I would love to know how that worked in Russia and how it worked in China. It is not easy to study. I, I will say, everyone, China does not have an mRNA vaccine, right? They, they've invested very heavily in that. They do not have an mRNA vaccine. They will. They're catching up very, very quickly. They're building the industrial base, and we are not. Um, and that's going to be, you know, so right now we're ahead, but very, very quickly that will change. Um, even Pfizer and Moderna are going to repurpose their mRNA for cancer vaccines. They're not going to have infectious disease applications. So if we, as a nation, decide that's important for us, we're going to need to build that and probably a public interest capability. Um, so we do have advanced development and manufacturing facilities, three of them, uh, four if you count the DOD in the U.S. We have not, if they're the right idea, they've been, again, improper execution. So we're going to have to double down on how we're doing that um, in a different way, sort of some of the ways that I described. You need sort of a pipeline of products that fill it. They, they devolve into these like contract manufacturing organization type models, which doesn't work. Um, so it, we, you know, we have to stop trying to do it efficiently, actually. <laughs> um, and then your, your last one was about, you said DITRA, you know, this, what it is is ARPA-H. Um, this is, yeah, and it's based on DARPA. And the idea is to commercialize, you know, we're, we're great at these early stage development things, but how do you do late stage development manufacturing and commercialize it? And so creating an, an, a health, technology analog for what we do for military technology. And it's a great idea. So if you look at the US innovation system and policy, it tilts towards basic science. You know, as we, it's post-World War II legacy, you know, we, this is, we've really invested very heavily in that. Less so, especially in the health sciences on late stage development and manufacturing. So that's important. Um, it's a good thing to do. It's, it's only $1 billion over three years at this point, but it's a good focus to have. What it misses still is if we're gonna have this on-demand capability, that's, um, that's different than this. This is you know, commercializing you know, individual projects. You know, we might have 10 that we're gonna prioritize and we'll commercialize them. That's not building an in-house capability to develop a medical countermeasure in 100 days. That, that's sort of a, an all of, that it's almost calls for an agency, you know, with something that's continuously practiced and that we do as a regular exercise on a regular basis. They're not doing that, and we still need that. So I would say um, it would be wrong to think that it's going to solve these, all of our problems. So. Uh, hi there, Kendall. I'm, hi. I'm a s student in the STS PhD program, so thanks so much for, for being with us. Um, I kind of just have a, a question asking you to elaborate on, on one of your arguments, which was that vaccine development can and should be faster. Um, as an observant and participant in the pandemic, I think part of what struck me listening to someone like Anthony Fauci was that, you know, things are going really fast, things are going really well, and part of what is taking so long to get a vaccine into people's arms is the fact that we have to test it, um, that there have to be like clinical trials on the vaccine. And um, my own understanding, and this may be incorrect, so please do correct me if I'm wrong, is that a company like Pfizer had to go into countries that are treatment poor, like Brazil, um, to do some of these clinical trials. And often, um, you know, this kind of clinical trial gets passed off as basic treatment. And so as much social and economic value as there might be in developing vaccines even more quickly, I'm wondering what kinds of social implications or possible social costs there might be, given that the way drug companies like Pfizer do their clinical trials is often 
outsourced to to you know treatment poor countries and so i'm just wondering if you could talk even a little bit more mm -hmm. about like what the considerations actually are of trying to develop sure. a vaccine yeah faster. yeah so there are a couple of things to say about that um first i mean one of the reasons trials went so quickly is that when we initiated clinical trials the bulk of disease was in the u.s we did clinical trials in the u.s that's, you know, we were patient, <laughs> we were the patient at that time. And so you have to go wherever the disease is. Um, and it doesn't always mean, you know, s some sort of form of subjugation. Um, you know, the, you know, a lot of the Ebola treatment units um, that they rolled out during that outbreak were dual use by design. You know, it was for maternal health as well. I mean, that's how you get people to come. It's, it's why you build it. You build it to be able to increase the infrastructure for primary health care delivery. Um, not always. I mean, obviously, it's not 100% that all the time, but that is the goal. I mean, that is sort of the design of it. Um, and, you know, so one of the ways that you would develop vaccines faster is to distribute the capability. So manufacturing capability right now is really concentrated in developed nations. And one of the goals of CEPI is to regionalize that, to create manufacturing capabilities in Africa, um, in, in places where it doesn't exist because, and to trans, you know, affirmatively transfer that technology and those skills and to have them be dual use so, I mean, they need, you know, measles vaccines. They need polio vaccines. Build that capability in Africa so they can have their own national um, capabilities. And then, then you've got something to build on when there is an outbreak. You can pivot, you know, to a pre-existing facility, and that speeds things up, and it expands capacity, which was really the key bottleneck for this pandemic, more than anything, more than evaluation. It was really manufacturing. Yeah. Hi. Oh, hi. hi. Uh, my name is Kavita. I enjoyed your lecture. Um, I have two, two questions, really, and uh, they build up somewhat upon the queries that David had started with, which is, as a historian, my first question was, I was curious why you didn't refer to HIV AIDS mm. as, uh, as a precedent. Because I think the big elephant in the room here is really the power of pharmaceutical companies, right? Mm. Which, um, which is what distinguishes the time of the Second World War that you draw back to mm -hmm. from global health, which mm -hmm. is really how do, you, how do you make sure that you have these public-private partnerships mm -hmm. where you can actually have equitable access. Yes. Um, and my second question really was on the notion of the production of vaccines as a security issue. Mm. You said that yeah. again and again in yes. your lecture. And I was thinking that that's actually very recent because it's only post 9-11 and post the Institutes of Medicine report on re-emerging infections mm. that in the US public health and the manufacture of vaccines gets increasingly aligned as a biosecurity mm. issue. Mm -hmm. And that's when a whole bunch of, you know, a, a lot of the budget that otherwise went to security gets realigned to issues of health and public health. It becomes a kind of transfer. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, is it really, you think, an, a good framing mm. to think about, you know, vaccine manufacture mm -hmm. as a security issue? Because to me, it seems to have two impediments. The first mm -hmm. is it seems to think of an enemy picture. Mm -hmm. It puts US still in this mindset of mm -hmm. some being some kind of a Cold War hero, mm -hmm. thinking of we have to do this alone and like, uh, you know, and not to do this collaboratively, mm -hmm. which I think is one of the first lessons of the GOARN, which is mm -hmm. surveillance networks and mm -hmm. other things that you need to work with others. Mm -hmm. So the security question and seeing vaccine development as a security issue seems a little bit problematic mm. to me. And can we get away from that framing and would it be useful to do that? And then mm. the footnote I had was really on Ebola itself. When you said you were at a meeting when someone was talking, you know, the mm. music and everything, and how do you actually relate to people who have vaccine hesitancy? How mm -hmm. do you actually speak about vaccine acceptance? And I agree, it's a very complex question. Mm. But part of the problem is also thinking of vaccines as kind of magic bullets in societies that don't have access yeah. to basic public health, right? Yeah. So however strong your advocacy 
messaging is. Mm. It's not going to reach the people if you only show up there when vaccines are to be delivered. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that there is a problem in the ways in which we think of vaccines as some things that are kind of introduced from above mm. and given to people who should be grateful for what we give them. True. So in yeah, a way, no, there's, no, no, that's a, so yeah. there's something, yeah. something out there which is problematic, and it doesn't always happen in other societies. It happens everywhere. Yeah. And we tend to think of it just simply as a discourse of science versus yeah. non-science. Yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. much more complicated than that. So yeah, I was yeah. just wondering if you could comment on the sure. HIV AIDS. So thing. in the yeah. STS tradition, it's a five-page, three-point <laughs> question. <laughs> Uh, so for the first, with the HIV, which is a really interesting, you know, moment in history um, and the power of pharmaceutical companies more generally, it's one of the things I focus on a lot and I mentioned it here today, contracting. It, it is really, really boring and it is a lever for social change. So one of the, you know, what's happened is all of this, you know, when you've, you've got you know, a government contractor sitting across the table from a very highly paid, highly skilled negotiator from a pharmaceutical company, and they don't end up with an agreement that represents public interest, right? So, but the, you, there are, you know, best practices. You know, if what, if global access or I, you know, um, you know, compulsory licensing or emergency provisions are what you need, we can identify the clauses that work and train up a cadre of government contractors to negotiate effectively next time. A good friend of mine, um, Julie Barnes Wise, has put together um, Gaia, which is doing this. They're reviewing all the contracts and they're creating a database of best practices. So not just governments, but NGOs, anyone who's making these kinds of deals can make them in the public interest. Um, there's, there, it's something we've never done before. There's enormous room for improvement. Um, it would make a big difference. So contracts are a lever for social change. Um, the second thing was, remind me. Um, regarding framing oh, vaccines yes, national as a sec security. As, as right. security issue. It's problematic, I get it. Um, one of the things I like to think about though is, let's say it went full circle and we can start to, if we've done this enough, we can start to frame national security as a global health issue. Like not global health in the sense that it's all about health, but in the sense that it's not a zero sum game, right? What if we can start to think about security as not a zero sum game with winners and losers? So it is, it can be problematic, but it doesn't have to be. I think it can, when you start to think about it in this term, you can start to have more collaborative solutions. Um, and you know, it's not new actually. It was a national, we did think about vaccines as national, an instrument of national security back in World War II. And one, it was one of the ways we won the battle of hearts and minds during the Cold War in Cold War contested countries. We would offer polio vaccines. We would compete with Russia over who would get to vaccinate this population with polio because it's how you end up looking like the good guy. So it was actually a really good thing we were defining this you know, in the way that we were. This was a good way for us to fight. Um, and so it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be bad. Um, so, thanks. Yeah. Hello. Um, I have a question that um, I think kind of builds off uh, the previous question when it comes to vaccine hesitancy. Um, so I was really struck by how you kind of described one of the solutions to the problem is kind of being rooted in civic education, mm -hmm. which made me think a lot about, um, I don't know, like the position of the government and, and, and public health um, and science towards certain populations. Um, I think globally, but particularly in the United States, I have spent a lot of time trying to explain to people why vaccines were safe and why they were good. And they had very good historical reasons as to why they shouldn't trust anything the government mm -hmm. would want to give them. Um, so I guess my question is, how are the kind of agencies and, and people that you are working with and that you're in conversation with, how are they thinking about this issue? Um, how are they thinking about um, ways in which to communicate trust that also kind of recognizes um, very real reasons why 
they aren't being trusted, if that makes sense. Right, right. I mean, it is, it's, this is the wrong analogy, but it, 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 here's a better way to say it. It's very tailored, right? So it's, it's, in, it, it's just being a good listener, too, right? You're not there with the answer. You're not there to tell them what to do. You're there to hear, you know, they, you know these, these are very targeted campaigns, to hear what their issues are and respond to those issues as opposed to you know, inventing what you think their issue is and telling them what they should be doing. Um, and you know, some populations have very, very good reasons, and you need to address it directly. Um, and so you know, from a policy standpoint, um, you know, there is no blanket policy. It's about it's community engagement is the term, and figuring out where you have strong pockets of resistance and engaging in a, you know, fig identifying you know, who's a trusted member of the community, who's a community leader, who will they, that's where you go first, and just listening, just understanding what their issues are, and then letting that person become the spokesperson to their community, if, if they agree with you, which is not a given, but it's sort of, it's very, very tailored. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Okay. Um, I want to point out uh, uh, an irony that I think underlies several of the questions you've been asked, and then ask a question about that. The irony is that you, as I listen to your fascinating talk, you've been arguing about how we could make what has been the single most successful part of America's response to this pandemic even better. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, but, it's a hard argument. <laughs> but, the prob but the problem is, as we all know, that America's response to the pandemic has been only middling mm -hmm. at best, despite this enormous success which you are talking yeah. about. And it's summarized for me best by a kind of two anecdotes, I suppose, which are the same thing repeated, that twice at least, I believe, former President Trump has stood on a public stage at one of his much beloved rallies and urged his audience of loyal followers to get vaccinated and been booed. Mm. So the very president who was partly responsible for this absurd metaphor of Operation Warp Speed, who was in favor, I believe, of having a vaccine even quicker than was eventually achieved, but that was much faster than I think most scientists at the time thought was likely. Mm. That president then found it, for all sorts of reasons we could go into, impossible mm. to persuade his own supporters mm. that they ought to be vaccinated. Mm. So uh, that's the irony. Now the. <laughs> Are you saying Trump was plagued with logical contradiction? No, I'm not <laughs> saying that, no. Um, but I think it may have been partly to do with the fact that he couldn't persuade his audience to do what yeah. he apparently wanted, yeah. and I agree with that. But I, I guess my question has to do with, it seems that what one needs is a very large, you used the phrase top down and command mm. and control several times. Mm. It does feel as if mm. the pandemic needs that kind of response. America is very bad at that right now when it comes to its, uh, and it was at that level, surely, in some mm. general sense, that the national response to the pandemic became as indifferent yeah. as it was. So how optimistic are you that re further refinements to the vaccine development process mm -hmm. are really gonna improve on the ground responsiveness and effective responsiveness to future epidemics? Right. Well, again, you know, you can divide it into there's the development problem and then there's the administration problem. Um, and, and that is a whole other set of considerations. And there, so this, the COVID commission has four task forces. One is vaccine. The other three deal with these issues. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are people who can give you a far more sophisticated answer than I can, but there's broad recognition that that's where it, it's difficult. You know, it's a federalized system. It became, you know, a, a centralized effort to develop. And then after McKesson developed all, you know, distributed all the vaccines, 99% at temperature and on time, then it was a state issue. The states had to administer them. And they were not prepared for that. And we've defunded 
state-based public health into non-existence. You know, it was, we did, we, there was nothing there to support that. Um, so I think we need to take a hard look at, are, you know, are we going to prioritize public health at the state level again? Um, and that is sort of appropriate, you know, to be at the state level. Every state has a slightly different set of public health concerns and, and how much they want their tax base to support it and what have you. But um, that, it's, that is the nature of the problem. So, yes, it, it does not, vaccines can't become vaccinations until we solve the state problem for sure. Hi, Dwight. Hi. Thank you for the really interesting talk. Yeah. So uh, my question, again, goes back to this idea of thinking about what we can learn from history and uh, the question of looking back at the HIV AIDS epidemic. Mm -hmm. And I think one way, perhaps, uh, uh, for me at least to think about what the pandemic uh, more recently has to teach us uh, in reflecting back upon the 90s is that it's actually a massive step backwards uh, in a particular Way. And what I mean by that is uh, one of the responses to the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic was that uh, several Global South countries came together to suggest that uh, there was a fundamental uh, international regulatory problem in terms of how vaccines were going to be circulated. And one of the ways out was compulsory licensing. So uh, basically the ability, ability for a Global South government to issue a license mm -hmm. uh, upon a vaccine. And, uh, enforce a uh, legal responsibility on a pharmaceutical corporation in the United States mm -hmm. to make for a limited time period mm -hmm. under emergency situation mm -hmm. something. Uh, but the US government uh, prior to the Trump administration going all the way back to the Obama uh, administration has taken a very strong anti-compulsory re regulation mm. line. Uh, the US trade organization, uh, the USDRO has consistently uh, suggested that this is uh, even though this is understood as uh, part of international law, mm -hmm. that the WTO uh, sig uh, signatory countries have s agreed that this is a good principle, mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. government, and I'm not even talking about the pharmaceutical corporations mm -hmm. here, the U.S. government has uh, decided to take uh, anti uh, uh, compulsory licensing mm -hmm. line, which then during this pandemic raised the question of a waiver. Mm -hmm. And in ideal circumstances, if compulsory licensing is working, we shouldn't even need a waiver. Mm -hmm. And then the government took an anti-waiver line. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think for me, the experience of the US government in responding to this at a global scale mm -hmm. has been to uh, basically undercut all the victories that were won after the mm. uh, kind of response to mm -hmm. uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic. And so in a way, the US has become a bottleneck in the international circulation of uh, uh, va vaccines in an equitable way. Mm. So, I wonder, so I wonder what you think about the motivations yeah. behind the US government yeah. in really taking such a hard line yeah. against the circulation of vaccines. No, this is a good question. This is a really important problem. Um, I will say it just um, for context, you know, the uh, Pfizer and Merck with their new antivirals, Paxlovid, and I can't pronounce the other one, um, have they they've contributed the um, the license to the medicine patent pool. So it is that license is free and available to low and middle income countries, no royalties starting today. Um, so they, de they don't have a hard line. I mean, this is what they're doing. Um, the way this will work is um, as long as we're in a pandemic, there's no royalty. Once we're out of a pandemic, which will be a very interesting thing to watch for all of you social commentators and historians, <laughs> because it really is. Like, if you look at what's the definition of endemic, it's expected levels, you know, talk about a social construct, you know, what, what do we accept? Um, and in, because of all of, there's money, there's money at stake for what we're gonna define when it's a pandemic and when it's not a pandemic. But once it's not a pandemic, um, middle income countries will have to pay a royalty and low income countries will continue to not have to pay a royalty. Um, vaccines are different, um, they have not, um, contributed in the same way. It's not a US choice. It's the pharmaceutical companies are in charge 
they've made that decision. Um, and you know, if you're worried about, it, the truth is the real bottleneck right now is that a lot of the knowledge required to develop these vaccines is in fact tacit. So giving the IP to another country doesn't actually help it. There's something called affirmative technology transfer. They need to take a team and send it over and show them how to make it. And you know, as we discussed earlier, you know, they don't always have the manufacturing facilities in country to be able to receive any form of affirmative technology transfer. So we talk about these IPR waivers, but it's kind of putting the cart um, in head of the horse. You need to work on some of these other things, too, to make it effective. Not to say that we shouldn't be doing it, but it's um, the, the conversation really gets derailed um, with that argument right off the bat. And yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. That that's, I think, fundamentally the problem with the uh, ask for a waiver, because mm -hmm. that'll achieve really nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, that's also the problem with the patent pool system, right? Because there's mm -hmm. no uh, necessity for technology, uh, any kind of technological transfer with a patent pool. Mm -hmm. And so uh, without a kind of uh, a regulatory mechanism, because we know this is not going to come out of the goodwill of pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. so, without a regulatory mechanism to enforce technology transfer, mm -hmm. a patent pool becomes sort of meaningless. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same reason mm -hmm. you described, but we were becoming meaning, meaningless. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I wonder what you think might be the way out of that. Well, I mean, you know, this is, it, it all stems from the fact that manufacturing capacity rests exclusively in the private sector. It doesn't have to be that way, right? You, you can have manufacturing in the public interest. You can have a, a national pharmaceutical company. Brazil does, Russia does. Um, and so you can create a pipeline. You can you know, designate you know, high public interest drugs. Uh, you know, it, let's say it's gonna be these pandemic products. You know, and we've got this viral prototyping program and we develop these platforms and we channel them into you know, the small batch manufacturing facilities, and the government can retain the IP on all of that. You don't have to negotiate with anyone if you've developed these capabilities in-house, and then you've got something that's truly in the public interest. You're no objective to make money. Um, so, I mean, it, otherwise it's complicated, right? Because if, you know, if Merck can't retain the IP or, um, you know, some smaller company can't transfer the IP, then they're not going to develop it, or a VC firm is not going to invest in commercializing it. I mean, understandably. So it's this is the model we have. I'm going to interrupt here for yeah. a second. Um, we have one more question, which I think will be. <laughs> um, we have a, Gus has organized a nice reception for everyone, and we can continue the conversation out in the um, uh, area out there. Let's have one final question, and then you can, I hope, join us. And thank you. Yeah, um, hi. So thank you, first of all, for like giving your talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, actually, a little bit more about this idea, for example, of moving or uh, developing manufacturing capabilities in countries that don't currently have them. Um, and again, just kind of a, as an extension of the previous question of about issues with thinking of things like vaccine development as a silver bullet, uh, where a country like the US could come into, could go into a different country and um, sort of just try to provide that as a solution without already having done the work to build trust and collaborate with the communities that they're trying to help. Um, so for me, this reads as more of an international development framing um, of something like this. And within international development, it's well known that when projects try, or when, you know, like groups of people try to make projects without talking to the stakeholders in the community that uh, this project would affect, mm -hmm. that like, it simply doesn't work. Um, and at best, it might be useless. At worst, it might actually like exacerbate existing inequities or um, cause like further dependency that makes it more difficult for those communities to become self-sufficient. And so I guess I'm wondering, um, given that we know that these are pitfalls that are common in international development, but they're not really 
visible when we think of vaccine development as something that is more of a manufacturing problem or a supply chain problem or a problem with um, like government, things like that, how do we justify using that framing or how do we avoid you know, missing these pitfalls by steering clear of different framings? Yeah, no, it's, uh, well, do you want me to talk just about vaccines or are you interested more generally in a more general comment about global health aid? Yeah, sure. Uh, global health is great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, when it, when it comes to vaccines, um, the WHO does a lot of work on technology product profiles and you know, trying to be very sensitive to um, you know, the use characteristics of a particular population. Like, you know, does it require refrigeration? You know, does it require, you know, what, what are the, you know, is it possible to, you know, dose it in this interval? You see patients that often. Um, and they will not, um, you know, in these technology product profiles, then, you know, um, direct development efforts by NGOs and pipeline accelerators, right? So that's sort of like the market research that they try to do to tailor it to the population. Um, it, it can be hard to get any closer than that unless they have like, you know, development facilities of their own, right? For so many of the vaccines that you might require in a low-income country, you know, you're going to require a, you know, a, you have to go where the development capability is. But they do try to be sensitive um, to the needs of that population. Um, I don't know if that helps. It's not perfect. Um, you know, they don't come in saying. I mean, then it, it, there can be mismatches. Um, but when it comes to, you know, healthcare delivery, the more you can, you know, increasingly, I think the goal is not so much that, um, you know, we're swooping in and this is how you have to do it and this is some sort of a gift or charity, but more of like a capability um, building framework where we're here to teach you how to provide primary care, you know, or um, maternal and fetal health in this particular community in your ways. But, you know, it's, an, it's also, I'm not the expert, but this is how I understand it from the way the WHO has talked about it. Yeah. Uh, sure, yeah. Okay, thank you okay. very much. Thanks, thanks to all of you who spoke, and thank you to Kim. Mm. Thank you. Thank you.